Good afternoon, my brothers and sisters. We'd like to welcome you to another show, The Word of Truth. Here at The Word of Truth, we do all our subject, all our lessons by subjects. And today's title of today's lesson is The Lord Giveth, The Lord Taketh Away. My name is Brother Elbert. I'll be the teacher for the day, and my reader is Brother Benaiah. We'd like to thank God and give him all praises and glory. I'd like to do this lesson today because in life and in past, God has always given his servants and his people something. And whatever he gave us, he gave it to us and he entrusted us that if we were obedient to him and continue to do his word and his, keep his laws and commandments, then he would keep us and we could keep that that God gave us. But what happens when we turn our back on God and then do what he had commanded us to do? Guess what he did? He took it away from us, just like he did the children of Israel, just like he did Adam in the Garden of Eden. He gave him eternal life and he trusted him in the Garden of Eden. And what happened when he sinned, eternal life was taken away from him. So we see right here that even in this earth, he gave man dominion over the earth, over everything in the earth. And guess what? Man has corrupted his soul that God, when he returned, he's going to take it back. So God has not forsaken the earth, but the earth has forsaken God. So when we're in our own land, in the land of Canaan, he had given us the land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he, he entrusted us with that. But what happened? When we stopped keeping his laws and his commandments, guess what? It got taken away from us. So God then forsaken Israel and kicked them out of the land. Israel forsaken God and got kicked out of the land. So we see right here, so this title of the day is left is Lord give it and the Lord take it away. And we're going to look at this as an example with Job, Job 1. Except with Job, that God had given him something, and in testing Job, he took it from him to test his faith. And Job held his integrity and held his trust. We're going to start this lesson out in Job 1, and Job 1 and verse 21. And when you get it, brother, read. And said, Naked I came out of my mother's womb. And naked shall I return thither. Now it said right here that when Job was being tempted or tested by Satan, God had allowed Satan to try to tempt Job by taking everything that he had. All his animals, all his possession, include his children. And Job knew, and he said in this scripture, he knew that if anything happened to him, it was because God had allowed it to happen. And the same as you, if you are serving of God, nothing happens to you unless God allows it to happen. So at this point right here, if Job had lost everything, this is what Job said right here. Keep going, brother. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Mm -hmm. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, the Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Here in today's time, this little thing happened to us. First thing we're going to do is, God, why did you let that happen? Why? Uh, I've been, oh, why did this happen to me? Why you let that happen? But Job held his integrity because he knew he had done no wrong. But if it was taken from him, he said, well, bless God. He gave it to me. He took it away from me. Keep going. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And he didn't sin. He didn't get mad through a temper tantrum. He did none of that. He sinned not, but he still worshiped and he praised God. Now, let's go look at this in Acts 2 and 38, because even at the point we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there is something that is given and entrusted in our hands. And in that hand, he gave us one thing and he gave us also another thing. And we're going to look at this. Let's go to jo uh, Acts 2 and verse 38. And this is when they found out that they had crucified the Messiah, Jesus himself. And they said, man and brother, what shall we do? Because they realized that the person they had crucified was the Lord and Savior himself. And then this is what Peter told them. Keep going. Then Peter said unto them, mm -hmm. repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Mm -hmm. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. He said, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, the one that you just crucified for the remission of sin, and you shall receive, something's going to be given to you, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And what is this? Because people believe that once you're baptized, you receive the Holy Spirit, but we're talking about the gifts 
of the Holy Spirit that God is going to entrust you and is going to put in your hands. And the Holy Spirit is not something that get into you and make you shout and talk in tongues and run through the church and all that and do flips and cartwheels and all that. We're going to see, he said, you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now let's look and see what are these gifts that God is going to give you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and we're going to start reading at verse 1. And when you get it, brother, read. Now concerning spiritual gifts, mm -hmm. brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away into these dumb idols, mm -hmm. even as ye were led. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, I give, you understand, I give to you understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. And no man can say that except but by the Holy Ghost. And that means that you have to be filled with the Holy Ghost and with the knowledge of God. And so we see right here that as you become a servant of God, God has given different gifts to different servants for the edifying of the church and the building of the body. And everybody has different gifts that God has given them if they receive them. Let's look at this, and we're going to look at some of these gifts that he's going to entrust us and give to us. Keep reading. Now, the, there are diversities of gifts, mm -hmm. but the same Spirit. Mm -hmm. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but the same God, which worketh all in all. Mm -hmm. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Mm -hmm. For... To one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. One is given the Spirit of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge mm -hmm. by the same Spirit. One is given the word of wisdom and one is given the uh, Spirit of knowledge. And you got to understand that the wisdom and knowledge are two different things because sometimes people confuse them. God can give you knowledge and he can also give you wisdom. Yes, sir. So what is the difference? Knowledge is knowing what to say and wisdom is knowing when to say it. So a lot of times people think it's the same thing. But wisdom, if you read Job in 28, is probably the most valuable thing, a most valuable commodity on the face of the earth, be it spiritual or materialistic. Wisdom is a very, very expensive and, and delicate and precious thing that you could ask God for. Keep going. To another, faith by the same spirit. Mm -hmm. To another, the gift of healing by the same spirit. The gift of healing. What do we have now? People dying in the church. People sick. People on walkers. Because people don't heal anymore. They just ignore that gift. They said, oh, that's something they did back in the day. But God is still in the healing business. Uh -huh. He has not changed. Keep going. To another, the working of miracles. Mm -hmm. To another, prophecy mm -hmm. to another discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues mm -hmm. to another the interpretation of tongues now what we mean by tongues we're talking about language god has blessed somebody to be able to speak the language of another language of another dialect like he did on the day of pentecost and we're not talking about that babbling tongues that no tongues is a language some have been blessed to speak another language that even studying that language and some have been blessed with the opportunity to learn how to interpret that language and these all different gifts that god put in the church among the people to help build up and edify the church keep going but all these worketh that one the self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will now he said all these god gives people and he give them to you as a gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, you go back in the recording room. I go back there and see all those different monitors and computers and everything like that. And I don't know what's going on. They be back there talking. It sound like foreign language to me. <laughs> Brother right here know how to operate all this. Know how to play the keyboard. Know how to sing. I can't do that. Praise God, Jesus. Because if I start singing, they'll run out of here. <laughs> so everybody has a gift and you have to know what that gift is that God gives you. And where do these gifts come from? Let's look at this. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Let's go to James, the first chapter. James, the first chapter. And we're just going to read one verse. That's verse number 17. James, first chapter, verse number 17. When you get it, brother, read. Every good gift mm -hmm. and every perfect gift is from above. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above. Keep going. 
and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He said there are no variableness. That means that God doesn't change. He doesn't waver. The same gifts he gave back then, he gives the same gifts now. And he gives it to you and he entrusts you with it to use it for his glory. Just like he gives us knowledge. He's given us knowledge now to know who we are and what is required of us to do for his glory, that it might help us. And as long as we take this gift and use what he has given us to edify him, we can keep it. Let's look at this. Let's go to uh, 2 Timothy, and we're going to read verse 1. 2 Timothy and verse 1. Chapter 1, and we're going to start reading at verse number 6. 2 Timothy, first chapter, verse number 6. And when you get it, brother, read. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now he said right here, he said, wherever I put thee in remembrance to do what? Stir up the gift. This gift that God gave you, you got to stir it up. If you make some soup or some stew and you put in the steak, you put in the beef, you put tomatoes, you put the peppers and the onions and all that stuff, whatever you use to put in the stew, you just don't put it in there and just let it cook. What do you do? Or the season and all that, what do you do? You put yep. the fork in there and you stir it up. Give it some juice, make it stir, make it mix it up. So we see right here that everybody that comes into the church, into the body of Christ, what do we have? We have different gifts. And we take these gifts and we stir them up. And we mix it all up so that we edify each other and build up the body of Christ to mix it all up together. Keep going. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love by of in a sound mind. He said, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He has not given us the spirit of fear to go around and be afraid of what's going on in this country right now, to be afraid of the coronavirus 19. I'm not saying don't be careful or use caution, but as a servant of God, he has not given us that fear to be afraid. But just caution, but not afraid that anything would come upon you. But he has given us a spirit of what? A power. And what is that power? We're going to look at what this power is. And he has given us also sound mind. That's why it says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. But now let's look at this power that he has given us also. Let's go to Luke the 10th chapter. Luke the 10th chapter. It's all about God giving us what he's going to give us. Because if you look at little posting that they put on Facebook and on YouTube and all this thing, and you have religious people getting on there and saying, God going to give you this, and he going to give you this, and you know, somebody going to, you going to go to your bank account, and somebody going to put $10,000 in there, and you're going to get this, and you're going to get this financial blessing. And they look at this as though they're using God as an ATM machine, what he's going to do for them, and what he's going to do for us, and what he's going to give you. But we're not talking about that giving, because what we're talking about giving is far better for far more important than material things. Let's look at this thing that he's going to give us. Let's go to Luke, the 10th chapter, and we're going to start reading at verse 17. And this is when Jesus sent out his 70 disciples. And he sent them out to do some healing and to cast out demons. And they came back and they was rejoicing because they were successful. Let's look at this. Luke, the 10th chapter, and we're going to start reading at verse 17. And when you get it, brother, read. And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Now they came back. They had been successful. They came back. They had cast out demons. They had done all these miracles. So when they came back, they was high-fiving. They were jumping up, bumping chests, fist pounding and everything because they had been successful in that. And what did Jesus say? He said, what? He said, what are y'all rejoicing for over that? Keep reading. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Mm -hmm. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He said, wait a minute. What you did, I gave you that power. I gave you that. You did it because I gave you. What was that power? His name. He said, I gave you that. You rejoicing over that. Don't be rejoicing over that. That's why he said in, uh, in, in Matthew, 
We talk about some was saying that day, Lord, Lord, have we have we not prophesied in thy name and cast out demons in thy name and healed the sick and done all these wonderful works in thy name? He's going to say, depart from me, ye work of iniquity. I never knew you. Because what they did, they did it in his name, which he gave them power to do that. He said, now, if you're going to rejoice, you rejoice over this. Keep reading. Notwithstanding, mm -hmm. this is rejoice not that the behold, I give you power to tread on serpents mm -hmm. and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Mm -hmm. And nothing shall in any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven mm -hmm. and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for sit, it seemed good in thy sight. He said, rejoice. If you're going to rejoice over something, you rejoice because your name is written in heaven. That's, if you, that's why you rejoice, because that's what's going to get you eternal glory. That your name is now written in the Lamb's book of life. So if you're going to rejoice, don't rejoice because you cast out demons and all these things. I gave you the power to do that. The tread on serpents or scorpions. I gave you the power to do that. But you rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Because guess what? It can also be taken out. Mm -hmm. That's why Job, that's why Paul said, even after I have preached the gospel, I myself can still be counted as a castaway. And that's why Jesus said, he that endured to the end, the same shall be saved. Now let's look at this. Because a lot of times people in the church that I came out of, they always want to pray to God. They always want to pray to Jesus and ask him for things. Ask him for things. As though God never existed no more. Whatever they ask me, let's go to Jesus. He'll do this. He'll do this. Just call on the name of Jesus. He's going to do this. He's going he gonna to give you this. And I used to say, well, wait a minute. What about God? They had it wrong. They had it backwards. The thing that Jesus would give you, we're going to read, we're going to say, he said, he said, ask in my name and I will, I will give it you. I will do it to you. I will do it for you. We said, if whatever you want, you ask in the Father's name and he will give it to you. If you call ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Let's look at this. Let's give you an example. Let's go to John 14. Because in the churches now, it's like that God does not even exist. They all want to go to Jesus, you know what I'm saying? But we have to pray in Jesus' name. Let's go to John 14, and we're going to start reading at verse 11. John 14 and verse 11. And when you get it, brother, read. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, mm -hmm. or else believe me for the very work's sake. He said either believe that I'm in the Father or the Father in me, or at least believe the works that I have done, all these miracles that I have done. One way or the other, believe me. Keep going. Verily, verily, I say unto you, mm -hmm. he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Mm -hmm. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. He said, you, he said all these works I've done, they were good works, but he said what? Greater works than these. You're going to be able to do because I'm going to my father. Why? Because when he go to his father, we'll be able to do all these things when we pray to the father in his name. So he said, greater works than these you shall be able to do. Keep going. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. He said, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, he said, that will I do. Not that I will give you. He said, that will I do. What he will do, he will give you power. That's what he will do. Keep going. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Mm -hmm. If ye ask anything in my name, I will do it. He said, I will do it. So he didn't say, I will give it you or you shall have it. He said, whatever you ask in my name, he said, I will do it. See, a lot of people are confused at thinking that, well, you go, uh, go to Jesus and ask him for anything and he'll give it to you. But what he's talking about right here, what he would do is that you, will, you want to cast out demons, you cast them out in Jesus' name. You want to lay hand on the sick, you lay hand on the sick in Jesus' name. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about going out there asking for a brand new house and he's going to bless you with that. And that's why they get confused with this. Let's look at this again. Let's go to John 15. And we're going to start reading at verse 7. John 15 and verse number 7. 
And when you get it, brother, read. If ye abide in me, mm -hmm. and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. He said, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. It shall be done unto you. Keep going. Herein is my Father glorified. That ye bear much fruit, mm -hmm. so that ye be so shall ye be my disciples. Mm -hmm. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. He said, As the Father hath loved me, so I will love you. If you abide in me, and I abide in you, keep going. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, mm -hmm. ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. That's what it all boils down to. By abiding in Christ and him abiding in you means one thing. Keep those laws and those commandments. That's what it means to keep those commandments. If you say you love me, keep my commandments. If you say you know me, keep my commandments. That's what it all boils down to. Let's look at this again because now when we pray to the Father in Jesus' name and we are going to petition him for something, this is what we do. Let's go to John, the 16th chapter. And we're going to start reading at verse number 23. We're going to skip down to verse 26. John 16 and verse number 23. And when you get it, brother, read. And that day shall ye ask me nothing. He said, and in that day ye should ask of me nothing. But what? Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. He said, but whatever you ask the Father in my name, guess what? He will give it you. So when you pray to the Father and you ask him for something in Jesus' name, he will give it you. He said, but in that day you ask me for nothing. But as you ask in my name, the Father prayed to the Father, he will give it you. Skip down to verse 26. At that day shall ye ask in my name, and I shall say unto you that I will pray to the Father for you. For the Father himself loveth you, because he hath loved me, and have believed that I came out from God. He said, the Father love you, because you love me and believe that I came from God. So everything that Jesus has promised us or that he has given us is by his power. That we may take his power, like he read earlier, and bring forth fruits. Because that's why he said the harvest is plenty, but the laborers are what? Are few. So he wants to give us that power so that we can go out and do whatever it is he need us to do or want us to do to bring in lost souls. And that's what it's all about. He said when these disciples went out and they cast out demons, and they was healing the sick and everything like that. He gave them the power to do that. He's not going to call you to be a disciple and not give you any tools to fight with. He's giving you. That's why he's, when the demons saw him, when he was coming through this country. And the demons saw him. They didn't know who it I mean, it's not like they had internet back then. And they knew who he was, but they knew the spirit in him that he was Jesus. That's why he said, thou art Jesus. Have you come to torment us before our time? They knew who he was. And so it's the spirit that was in him because the father abided in him. And he abided in the father. So that's what he's telling us now. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, guess what? You will ask the Father whatever you will and he will give it you. So we see right here that it boils down to one thing, and that's keeping his laws and his commandments. If you love God, keep his commandments because everybody wants to believe that God just loves everybody. He loves everybody. And that's why people aren't, aren't afraid because God is not going to allow anything to happen because God is love. He loves everybody. Well, does God love everybody? Let's look at this. Let's go to Proverbs, the eighth chapter. Go to Proverbs, the eighth chapter. And we're going to read one verse. And that's verse number 17. Proverbs, the eighth chapter and verse number 17. And when you get it, brother, read. I love them that love me. Oh, he said, I love them that love me. Well, let's see then. Keep going. And those that seek me early shall find me. He said, and those that seek me early shall find me. What does that mean? Early means that he had, you have placed them first in your life. 
above everything, above yourself, before your family, before your wife, your children, your cousin, everything. He said, if you seek me early, that means you put me first, guess what? You will find me. So he said, I love them that love me. And who is it that love him? Let's look at this. Let's go to 1 John 5. Let's see who it is that love him because it's more to it than just saying, I love the Lord. You used to sing a song in the country, I love the Lord because he heard my cry and pitied every groan. You know, but what does it mean to really love the Lord? Let's look at this. Let's go to 1 John 5 and we're going to start reading at verse 1. 1 John 5 and verse 1. And when you get it, brother, read. Whosoever believeth that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Mm -hmm. And everyone that loveth him, that begotteth, loveth him also, that is begotten of him. Mm -hmm. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. He said, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and do what? Keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. Commandment. That's why he said in 1 John 3 and 18, he said, my little children, let us not love in tongues or in words, but let us love in deeds and in truth. That means you show love. Love is something you do. It's not just something that you say. If you love your wife and your children like you say you do, you just don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, I love y'all, and then go back to bed and don't provide for them. There ain't no food on the table. You know, if you love them, it's something that you do. You just don't say it, you do it. So if you say that you love God, it ain't just something you say, it's something that you do. And what is it that you do? And that's keep those laws and those commandments. Keep going. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. Mm -hmm. And his commandments are not grievous. His commandments are not grievous, meaning his commandments are not hard. They are not hard. They are not hard. I will tell you what. I will bet you $500 that this brother can drive home today without robbing a bank, without stealing something. Is that hard to do? No, it's not hard to do. What? Just read, read thou, should not keep, thou should not steal. It's not hard. The only thing that's hard about it is for you that won't, don't want to keep them. But that's what he mean by that. He said these commandments are not grievous. They are not hard. So everything boils down to keeping the laws and the commandments of God. And let's look at this again. Let's go to John 15. You're going to read one verse. John 15. And we're just going to read one verse and verse number 16. John 15. And we're going to read verse number 16. And when you get it, brother, read. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Now, what's Jesus saying right here? Jesus said, "Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you." He's talking about his disciples right here. That you should do what? That you should. That I have ordained you that you should bring forth fruit. And what else? And that your fruit should remain. Mm -hmm. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, He may give it you. There it is again. He may give it you. If you ask the Father in his name, he will give it you. So we see right here that Jesus said, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. So when we look at time, who else did Jesus choose as his people? Way back when he chose the nation of Israel and placed them above all the families of the earth. He said, I have, chose, I have chosen you above all the families of the earth. For all the earth is mine. He has also chosen the nation of Israel, his chosen people, to be a special people unto him, a peculiar people unto him. And he gave them his laws, his statutes, and his commandments, and said that when, even when they were in their own land, he said, Israel, in your own land, after we came out of bondage, he said, if you obey me and keep my laws and my statutes, you can remain in the land. So he gave them the land. So when they got there, they had an option. To either obey God and stay in the land or disobey him and get kicked out of the land. So what happened? They disobeyed him and got kicked out of the land. Like he gave it to them, he took it away from them. So that's also, he back then when he, Jesus was God in the first person, he chose Israel, the nation of Israel, as his chosen people. Let's look at this. 
Let's look at something else that God gave us. He gave us his spirit. He gave us his spirit, not just here, but even back then. We're going to go to Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter. And we're going to look at the fact that even back then, God never, God never wanted strangers to rule over his people. He always had kings. If they were kings over his people, he made them kings and he made them also preachers. He didn't just have a secular man ruling over his people. And anybody that ruled over his people had to be first his servants. He had to place his spirit in them. And when he placed his spirit in them, guess what? As long as they obeyed him and kept those laws and those commandments, they could remain as leaders over his people. But the minute they messed up, the first thing he did was took his spirit back from them. Let's look at this. Let's go to Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter. And we're going to start reading at verse 15. Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter and verse 15. And when you get it, brother, read. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee. Mm -hmm. Whom? The Lord thy God shall choose. He said, you shall set king over you whom God shall choose to be king over you. Keep going. One from among thy brethren mm -hmm. shalt thou set king over thee. Mm -hmm. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee which is not thy brother. He said, thou shalt not set a king over you. Nobody was supposed to rule over Israel. Even to this very day, his chosen people, there was a stranger. But what is this? Because we're in a strange land. As the true Jews, as the true Israelites, we're in a strange land. So guess who rule over us? Strange people. Strange leaders. That's who's ruling over us now. He said, thou shalt not, thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not of thy brother. And why do they sit over us now? Because we're still in captivity. I don't care what happens November 3rd. We will still have a stranger over us, mm -hmm. which is not of our brother, which is not of our people. So it doesn't matter who becomes president of the United States, because come Monday morning, I got to still get up and go to work. I still will have bills to pay. I still will have taxes to pay. They still going to be rolling in. So it doesn't matter. Let's look at this. Keep going. But. He shall not multiply horses to himself, mm -hmm. nor cause the people to return to Egypt. Back in the bondage. Keep going. To the end that he should multiply horses. Mm -hmm. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Mm -hmm. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. He said, neither shall he multiply wives to himself, because now we have brothers who believe, who are in the camps, who believe that they can have more than one wife. They actually believe that. You have a problem with one. Now you want two, three, four, and five. But he said you should not multiply wives unto yourself. Keep going. That his heart turned not away. That your heart turned not away. And that's exactly what happened to Solomon. Keep going. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Mm -hmm. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out that which is before the priest of the Levites. Now, let's go, um, I want to go back to the end of that 17th verse where it says, Neither shall he greatly multiply himself silver and gold. Those prosperity preachers mm -hmm. on Sunday morning, getting them big dollars, packing the house. And when he come out there and sell them people, he know it's going to be a good payday today. So guess what? That means that his car is two years old now. It's time for him to get a new car now. It's time for him to get some new suits now. And that's exactly how they made it. And God called it just like, because just like it happened today, he called it. He said, don't multiply silver and gold to yourself. Doing it just for the riches. And that's what they're doing now. They're doing it for the riches. Multiplying silver and gold unto themselves. And then it says right here, and it shall be when he sit upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write a copy of this law in a book. That means he was a preacher. So look at this. Keep going. They write a law of the book out of the out of that which is before the priests mm -hmm. and the Levites. Mm -hmm. And it shall be with him. And he shall read therein all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes and to do them. Mm -hmm. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren and that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. And that you don't turn from these commandments. Other words, don't compromise. Don't turn to the right hand and don't turn to the left hand. 
You have to keep this law down the letter to the book. You can't say, well, I keep nine out of the ten of the laws. That's good. No. He said, you keep these. Don't compromise these. Boys. And don't be lifted up. Because we have brothers now been in the word two months. And they get lifted up. Get a little knowledge, they get puffed up. And we were saying earlier, they get full of pride. And pride falls, fall, what is it? Pride falls before destruction in the haunted heart, heart before the fall. the fall. And that's exactly what happened. And then the brothers go off the deep end. And because they get a little knowledge, they get, all of a sudden they get deep. And all of a sudden they know more than the teacher. And they get thrown away. They get cast away. They get overtaken. They fall away. He said, don't get puffed up. And when he taught this, he was not only teaching it for himself, but he was passing on to the people also. Let's look at this because the king back then, not only was he king, but he was what? He was a preacher. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 1. We're going to read one verse. Ecclesiastes, the first chapter, and we're going to read one verse. And it's verse number 12. Ecclesiastes 1 and verse number 12. And when you get it, brother, read. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. This is what Solomon said. He said, I, the preacher, was king over Israel. Where? In, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And what does that signify also? When Jesus was here, what is he? He was a minister. He was a preacher, just, just say. And when he come back, he's going to come back as what? King. So we see right here, he said, I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Because like I said then, once they was king, what God did to them, he put his spirit within them before he made them king. Because he didn't want strangers ruling over his people. And let's just take a look at this. Let's look and see what happened when Israel demanded a king from God. Because they wanted a king like everybody else, a king that they could look at. And what happened? Samuel got angry with him and came to God and said, they want a king, they want a king. And God told Samuel, Samuel, don't be upset, don't be mad. They haven't rejected you, they rejected me. So let's look at this. When God had called Samuel, or called Saul to be king, let's go to 1 Samuel, the 10th chapter. 1 Samuel, the 10th chapter. And we're going to start reading at verse 6. 1 Samuel 10th chapter, we're going to start reading at verse 6. And this is when God had told Saul, uh, it's told Samuel to tell Saul that he's going to meet these different people on his way. He's going to run into some people that had kids and had, was carrying loaves of bread and carrying wine. And so he was giving them, he giving him instruction of the type of people that he was going to run into. He said, you're going to run into also some prophets. And when you come across these prophets, you're going to prophesy to them. Let's look at this. Let's go and see uh, 1 Samuel 10, and we're going to start reading at verse number 6. And when you get it, brother, read. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, mm -hmm. and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come on you, Saul, and it's going to turn you into another man. And guess what? You're going to start prophesying. But he had to do this to Saul before he placed Saul as king over Israel. So what did he do? God gave him his spirit. He anointed him and gave him his Holy Spirit. Because he wanted him ready to rule over his people. Keep going. And let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee. Mm -hmm. For God is with thee. When these signs come up to, upon you, Saul, guess what? It's going to be a sign. And he want you to know that God will be with you as long as you obey me. Keep going. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal. Mm -hmm. And behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Mm -hmm. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. Mm -hmm. And... It was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. He said, what happened? When he turned and was walking away from Samuel, after Samuel had just got through talking to him right then and there, God gave him another heart. God gave him that. Keep going. 
God gave him another heart. Mm -hmm. All and all those signs came to pass that day. Mm -hmm. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, mm -hmm. and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. Now, when that Spirit of God came upon Saul, he began to prophesy. And they ain't ever known Paul, Saul to be any kind of religious man, and it shocked them. He began to prophesy. How did he prophesy? Because God had put his spirit in him. He had gave him a new heart and turned him into another man. Keep going. And it came to pass when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, what is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? They said, whoa, what do you mean prophesying? Saul is prophesying now? He ain't never done that before. Who is this? What do you mean he's prophesying? What did happen to him? He didn't recognize him. See, that happened to us. Did it happen to you, Brother Benai? Soon you got into his word, all of a sudden, some of your own family members didn't recognize you. And you too. They look at you and say, what is this? Man, the guy, he's he quoting scriptures now. He's going to class. He's reading the Bible now. He's studying now. He's keeping the feast days. He's keeping the dietary law. What is happening to you? Because they notice a sign. They notice a change in you. And they notice a change in Saul. Because God had given him something. And as long as Saul obeyed him, he could have it. He could keep it. But what happened? When Israel came out of Egypt before this, and they was out in the wilderness, the Amalekites, they came down and attacked the children of Israel. And God told, 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 told Moses, don't worry about it. He said, just get the children out through the wilderness. I'm going to remember you, Amalekites. I ain't going to forget you. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to take care of you. But God just wanted to get them out into the wilderness. But the Amalekites came out and fought against the Israelites. But God brought them through that. So one thing about God, he don't forget. And when he say he's going to do something, he's going to do it. Uh -huh. So what happened? When Saul became king, God remembered. Oh, yeah. I remember the Malachites. He said, Saul, look, I want you to go down there and I want you to kill them. Kill the king, the children, the animals, everything. And I don't want you to leave nothing. But what happened? Saul disobeyed God. And when he disobeyed God, this is what happened. As long as he obeyed God, he had the spirit of God in him. But when he disobeyed God, this is what happened. Because what he wanted to do, he brought back King Agag, brought back the spoils of that, of, that, of that city. And God was angry and had repented God that he had made him king. Let's look at this. Let's go to 1 Samuel 16 and we're going to start reading at verse 12. 1 Samuel 16 and we're going to start reading at verse 12. Because at this time, God was about to make, told Samuel, told Samuel to choose another king. And what happened when Samuel went down and went down to, to and he brought these brothers before him. And Samuel knew that none of these brothers that they had brought before him were the ones. So he asked their father, he said, do you have anybody else out here? And he said, yeah, we have David, but he's out there watching the sheep right now. He said, well, go bring him in. And when they brought David before him, Samuel knew that's him. And what happened? This is when he anointed him. Let's go to 1 Samuel and 16. And we're going to start reading at verse 12. And when you get it, brother, read. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance. He was a little guy. He was a good looking little boy. That's what he was. He was a good looking little boy. And he was very ruddy. Keep going. And goodly to look to. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. For this is he. See, God looks at the heart of man. We look at the outside, but God looked at the heart of man. Keep going. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Mm -hmm. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So when he anointed him before he took down Samuel, before he took down Saul as being king, guess what? 
He anointed someone else and had them ready to take his place. And that's just the way it is in today's time. When you think you missed the know it all and you can do it all and you don't think anybody can replace you because maybe you hold some kind of position in God's house. Guess, guess what? That spirit that is within you that causes you to get all prideful and lift it up, you take it from you. Mm-hmm. And somebody just standing back in the wings waiting to step in, just like a baseball player. When the pitcher's out there pitching and he start messing up and they start hitting on him, guess what? You see somebody in the dugout warming up, ready to be <laughs> yes, called sir. in. And before you know it, the manager does what? He called timeout. He go out to the mound, tell the pitcher, go take a seat. And he called in the relief. And he come in and he finish up the job. God always has somebody on the sideline waiting to be called. So we see right here, little David, little ruddy kid, good looking boy, was standing on the sideline waiting to be called in. And so guess what? God was about to call him in. But before he called him in, he got him ready because he was about to do something to brother Saul. He was about to take something from Saul that he had given him. The Lord gave it. Lord, take it away. And let's see what it is he's about to take away from Saul. Keep reading. Let's go to verse 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. The spirit of the Lord departed from him. He took it away because Saul disobeyed him. So he took it away from him. And what happened? And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And an evil spirit came up. Why is that? Because either this, either you're going to have the spirit of God in you. Or you're going to have an evil spirit in you. Ain't no in-betweens. That's it. You either have a spirit of God or the spirit of uh, evil spirit is going to be in you. There are no gray areas there. So when he took the, when the spirit of God departed from him, guess what? That evil spirit just stepped right in. Keep going. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubles thee. Now behold, an evil spirit from God troubles him now. Now he's full of trouble now. Let's look at this again because that was a mistake that David made. And when David was in his castle one day and he looked over and he saw Bathsheba and he fell in love with her just looking at her. And her husband Uriah was an army, was a soldier. And David said he had to have her. And he sent for her. And he sent for her. And he laid with her and she became pregnant. So when Uriah, her husband, came home, guess what? David tried to get him to go home and be with his wife. But Uriah wanted to hang out with him. But David wanted him to go home and be with his wife because she had gotten pregnant and said wanted her to be with his wife so that Uriah would think that that was his baby. But guess what? Uriah just wanted to hang out with David. And what happened was when they went into war, He had sent a message to have Uriah put at the front of the line so that he could be killed. And that's exactly what happened. He was killed. And now David has his wife. And when God saw that, he was angry. And he told Nathan, the prophet, he said, I'm mad. And let's see what happened right here, because that's why David wrote Psalm 51, because he was he was so afraid now because of wrong and the evil that he had done. Let's go to Psalm 51. Psalms 51, because David was fearing that what would happen to him was the same thing that happened to Saul. Let's look at this. Let's go to Psalms 51, and we're going to start reading at verse 10. And when you get it, brother, read. Create in me a clean heart, O God, Mm -hmm. and renew a right spirit within me. He said, renew a right spirit within me. He said, create in me a clean heart. And renew a right spirit within me. And what did he say in the next verse? Cast me not away from thy presence Mm -hmm. and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He said, don't cast me away from your presence. And he do what? Whatever you do, don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. And that's how we have to feel today. Before you go to do something wrong, God has given you a little spirit in you. You pray and ask God, whatever you do, God, just don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. So he said right here, cast me not away from thy presence. What do you mean by cast me not away from thy presence? That means he don't want God to turn his back on you. Because that's what happened to Israel when we was in our land. We were in our own land, flowing with milk and honey. 
And all we had to do in order to stay there and enjoy that land was to do what? Continue to obey God. But what happened? We turned away from God and started serving other gods that the people that we drove out before them were serving. And what happened? God cast us away from his presence. And when he cast you away from his presence, that means he don't even see you no more. So he told David, right? And David said, he said, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now let's look at this because there was something that was given to Adam in the Garden of Eden. And that one thing that was given to Adam in the Garden of Eden was what? Eternal life, which was what? The tree of life. He gave it to Adam and Eve and what happened? They sinned and it was what? Taken away. And let's look at this. Let's go to Genesis, the second chapter. And we're going to read one verse. And it's verse number nine. Genesis, the second chapter, and we're going to read verse number nine. And when you get it, brother, read. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Yeah, it's very rich, you know, right now. He had the trees that were good for food. And he's going to talk about another tree right here that he told Adam and Adam not to eat from it. Which was that? Keep going. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now he's talking spiritual right here because at the beginning of the day he talked about these trees that were good for food. Now these trees he's talking about right here were eternal life, which was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Those were spiritual trees he was telling them to stay away from. Let's go to Genesis, the third chapter. Because what happened, you know that story, what happened? They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what happened now, God is about to pass sentence on them. Let's look at this. Let's go over here to uh, Genesis, the third chapter. And we're going to start reading at verse number 22. Genesis, third chapter and verse number 22. And when you get it, brother, read. And the Lord God said, behold. The man has become as one of us to know good and evil. He said, now behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Because before they ate from that tree, what did they knew? They only knew good. They only knew of the tree of the not. They only knew of the tree of life. And they had it made. They had it made in the shade. And all they had to do was just stay focused and believe and trust God. Just like we were when we were in our own land. All we had to do was keep those laws and those statutes and those commandments and we could have enjoyed the land. But what happens when you disobey God? He kicks you out. It's just like if you had a house. and You got rules and regulations set up in your house for your children to follow. Because if you don't, they're going to do whatever they want to do. A friend of mine friend of mine had a 23, 24 year old son. He had raised him up. Son grew up in the house. And as he got older, he told his son, you know, the rules and the regular, not, don't come in late at night, you know, two o'clock in the morning, all that. And one day his son just came home and he loved his son. And his son just said, dad, I need to talk to you. He said, okay, son. He said, I just need to talk to you as man to man. He's okay. He said, I can't deal with all these rules you got. There's too many rules in this house for me. He said, now, I ain't a kid no more. He said, now, I'm not saying you treat me like a kid. He said, but I can't live under your roof no more. He said, you just got too many rules for me. And I can't deal with this no more. And the brother, he listened to him. He said, oh, okay. And then he listened to him, didn't even interrupt him. And then his son, he says, is that all you got to say? He says, that's all I got to say, man. I just can't deal with these rules no more. He shook his hand. He said, son, he stuck his hand out and shook his hand. He said, you know what? I'm glad we had this talk. He said, I'm glad that you man enough to come to me and tell me this. He said, I appreciate it. He even hugged him. I appreciate that. He said, now, ain't but one thing you got to do right now. You got to pack your bags. You got to get out. <laughs> And you know what he did? He packed, packed his, his bags, bags and he got out. That happened years ago. And to this very day, they're the best of friends. So. He, because when he got out on his own, he saw what it felt like to be a man. The whole while you saying that, when he said you got to pack the bags and get out, well, you know what the mother was saying. Don't do that. Don't make him leave. He said, no, he got to go. He got to go. 
It's time for him to go. When you get to the point that you can't obey my rules, it's time to go. Yes. And they became best friends. Yes, sir. So when the children of Israel was in our own land, as long as we obeyed the rules of the house in our land, we could stay there. When we got to the point that we got to start serving other gods, God, I just can't keep them laws no more. Them commandments, they said, you know, they are right, but I just can't, I can't follow them no more. So what God told Israel, y'all got to go. It's time for you to get out. Yes, sir. So what happened? We got kicked out. Now we're getting all beat upside the head, sold into slavery. Uh -huh. I guarantee you, when we get back over there, we ain't messing up no more. Mm -hmm. We're going to follow whatever rules he put in front of us. So you want us to do that? Okay, we're going to do it. Because life has whooped us in the shape right now, those who will obey. So we see right here that now the children of Israel, I mean, uh, Adam and Eve right here, they got to go. Keep reading. Genesis 3 mm -hmm. and 22. Mm -hmm. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to mm -hmm. know good and evil. Mm -hmm. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from mm -hmm. the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Mm -hmm. So he drove out the man drove and him out. Mm -hmm. he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So he kicked them away. He took away the tree of life. Now, at the very beginning of the Bible, he gave us the tree of life, which is eternal life. And through the process of time, at the last book of the Bible, the last chapter, almost the last verse, he is offering it back to us again. He took it away from us. Now he's ready to give it back to us. Let's go to Revelation 22 and we're sorry, reading at verse 12. And when you get it, brother, read. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me mm -hmm. to give every man according as his work shall be. Mm -hmm. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, mm -hmm. the first and the last. Mm -hmm. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Blessed are they that do his commandments, the same ones. The got us kicked out of the land are the same ones we got to do to get back in the land. Keep going. That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The same commandments that we didn't keep that got us kicked out of the land are the same ones we got to keep in order to get back in the land. So we see right here is a blessed our day to do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life. That same tree of life that we lost in the Garden of Eden and may enter in through the gates into the city. So I hope that someone got something out of this lesson. I'd like to say that shalom and God bless you.